Okay, everyone, I'm, I'm going to um, resume by talking about how you can program uh, transactional memory. I'm going to be describing a, uh, an, an Intel, um, the, the, the Intel RTM interface. This, these are C libraries. Uh, the most natural way to write this is to uh, use the uh, C interface that, uh, that they give you. And pretty much the code looks like this. What does that uh, mean? So there, there is a, um, a system call called xbegin, transaction begin. And it has this weird, <coughs> weird meaning, a little bit like fork or vfork in Unix, where you call it and it comes back with a code. And if the code, if, if you see this code, this means you are executing a speculative transaction. So when you see that, that means you go ahead and do what you need to do. If you see anything else, yes? Is that better? All right. Okay, so if xbegin returns with this code, you're executing a transaction. If it returns with anything else, you try the transaction and it aborted. So what happens is the first time you call it, you execute the code, if that fails, the hardware resets the memory and it resets your program counter, but changes the return code. And here you could decide what to do when your transaction didn't work. You could say, well, I'm going to retry it because it looks like it was a synchronization uh, problem with some other thread. And if I retry it, it will probably work. You could look at the code and say, oops, this looks like a, an illegal instruction was executed. I'm not going to retry the transaction because it will probably happen again. It will probably fail again. So there are lots and lots of information that you can get out of the return code. Uh, not enough information, but still. Uh, one thing you could do is you could say, my transaction aborted because I asked for it to abort. So here I'm doing bit masking, and if the bit says it was an explicit abort, then there's someplace else where you can find a, uh, a, a code. It could be that it was a synchronization conflict. If it was a synchronization conflict, then maybe it makes sense to retry your transaction again, maybe after a, uh, some kind of back off. If, you're, if you read too much information into your cache and your cache overflowed, then maybe it doesn't make sense to retry because the same thing will happen again. Uh, there are lots of other abort codes as well. So let's stop for a second and think about why could a transaction abort for apparently no reason. So <clears throat> all the other, there is a miscellaneous code which basically says things broke and we're not going to tell you why. So what could be going on? Well. A transaction will abort if the data set is too big. Remember, we read our information into the cache. If you modify the information in your cache line, you cannot write it back to memory while the transaction is active because that data is speculative. It, uh, my, if you abort the transaction, you have to undo it. So we have to keep it in the cache where it's easy to, uh, to uh, fix it. So if you're transaction overflows your L1 cache, or in the case of IBM, your L2 cache, then you're going to abort. Uh, your transaction could abort because it was too slow. If it runs for a long time, then your processor would generate a timer interrupt. And the first thing a timer interrupt handler does is it clears out the cache and aborts your transaction. So if this happens once, maybe you should try it again. If it happens every time, then maybe your transaction is just too long. Now, uh, there are also lots of situations where Intel, for its own reasons, decides to abort your transaction. Uh, it could be that uh, you had a TLB miss, you executed an illegal instruction. Uh, it could be that you had a page fault, a page fault and a TLB miss. There's all kinds of very complicated things that could happen. And uh, you know, as a result, your software always has to be prepared for the 
possibility that your hardware transaction will never commit. So you always need to have some kind of a backup a path. So a sensible thing is you try it. If it fails, you try it again a few times. You look at the code and see, does this look like a permanent failure or does this look like a transient uh, problem? So one way to address this is to combine hardware and software in fairly simple ways. And this is usually called hybrid transactional memory because it's half hardware and a half a software uh, wrapper. <coughs> so the simplest thing you can do is if your transaction fails, then uh, forget about speculation. I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way with locks. So it might look something like this. Uh, when I start the transaction, the first thing that I do is I read the state of the lock. So I don't acquire the lock. I read the actual bits. This is important because it guarantees that if somebody else actually acquires the lock, they'll have to write to it. And if they write to that bit, then that will conflict with me and abort my transaction. This is how we get speculative and non-speculative transactions to work together. So it's important to read the data but not uh, modify it. Uh, then, if it turns out that the lock bit that I read is already acquired by someone else, then uh, there's nothing I could do, so I'm going to abort the transaction. So underscore x abort says, I want to, I want to cancel this transaction. You know, I'm, I'm panicking. I don't want to uh, continue this. OK, if your transaction fails, then you say, well, I tried, I tried being nice. That didn't work. So I'm just going to uh, acquire the lock, do the work, and then unlock the work. And notice that by acquiring the lock, I'm going to abort any other speculative transactions that are trying to run concurrently. So <coughs> this is such a common a pattern that Intel has built this into the hardware. And uh, they provide something called uh, lock elision, where you can take the binary code and before each lock instruction, you can put a, an operation that is a no-op on architectures that don't support transactional memory, but that tells the hardware, OK, please execute everything between this lock and the unlock speculatively. Try it once. If that doesn't work, then uh, go back and re-execute it. And this is uh, nice because it means you can take legacy code. You can take code that was written uh, 10 years ago and edit the binary and get the benefits of a speculative execution. So the first time around, you read the lock and execute speculatively. If that fails, then you simply uh, acquire the lock and do it again. But you don't need to write the code to do this. Now, often you do want to, to uh, write the code to handle failures, because maybe you want to retry multiple times. Maybe you want to do something intelligent. But if, you, if what you want is simple, then uh, this is a, a way to do things. Uh, why do we want to do this? Well, often when you acquire locks, you're doing this conservatively. So it's often the case that I am pretty sure that uh, there is no data conflict between these threads. But I can't prove it. And maybe once in every billion uh, executions, there is a data conflict. And it would be unfortunate if uh, uh, things were to go wrong. Uh, but with locks, you have to lock every time if there's even the possibility of a conflict. With speculative execution, if conflicts are sufficiently rare, then you win in a big way uh, by executing in a speculative way. And you pay more when you fail. But if that's sufficiently rare, then uh, we don't care. So with, with locks, there's serialization. With lock elision, in most of the cases, uh, there is no uh, serialization. Uh, let me describe a, another <coughs> technique that you can use for um, using a transactions. And that is to say that um, locks and transactions don't necessarily need to be enemies. That you can use hardware transactions to make locks uh, much more efficient. So I'm going to describe a very simple uh, example. The particular example I give you could be done in other ways. So it's not uh, perfect, but it's, uh, it's short and simple and illustrates the, uh, the point that I want to make. So one way to design, for example, a list is something called hand over hand locking. The idea is you start by locking the first element, then holding onto the first lock, you then lock the second element. 
kind of like a child on, on one of those uh, playground uh, structures. And in this way, you can move down the list. Now, this is not actually a very good way of designing a concurrent list. There are much better ways, but I'm going to use this as an example because it's uh, simple. So, for example, if I want to remove a B, then I lock a B, and I lock B's predecessor, and I swing the pointer. <coughs> and uh, this is safe. So with lock teleportation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out, I'm going to use hardware transaction to skip some intermediate steps. So I start out in the same situation where I've locked the beginning of the queue. Now I'm going to start a hardware transaction. And under that transaction, I'm going to just read through the list without acquiring any locks. And then at some point, I'm going to say I've gone far enough. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the lock bit where I started and set the lock bit where I, where I ended and then commit the transaction. So from the outside, it looks as if the uh, lock vanished from one place and appeared in the next place without going through any intermediate um, uh, places. So if an outside observer will see a lock over here, they, you blink, and then the lock uh, appears over there. And uh, this is done as part of the hardware transaction. So no intermediate locks are required. Uh, the place where this pays off uh, in a bigger way, which I won't talk about in uh, detail, is not so much with locks as it is with uh, free storage management. If you don't have garbage collection and you want to use hazard pointers, then this is a way of eliminating hazard pointers. So if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. So <clears throat> interesting question is, how far should I teleport? How big should my transaction be when I go from one end to the other? Now remember that this is dangerous, because if I overflow my cache, then uh, my transaction will abort. So if I don't go far enough, then it's inefficient. I missed an opportunity. If I go too far, my transaction will abort. Uh, if I have a shared cache with another uh, thread, then it might be difficult to predict how much cache space I have. So this is a, um, an interesting question. So a natural approach is to choose your size adaptively. And there are many ways you could do this. So we just borrowed an idea from um, network protocols where if a transaction commits, then we cautiously make the limit a little bigger. If the transaction aborts, then we say, oh, we got too greedy. We're going to cut, it, cut the uh, transaction size in half. Because it may be that suddenly there's a lot of uh, contention or something going on. So we grow slowly and shrink uh, aggressively. Uh, what the code uh, looks like is the following. We have a teleport method that takes a locked uh, node. Notice this is C++ because uh, you know, we're using, um, uh, we need to use these low-level libraries. Uh, we have a locked node in a sorted list. We have a value that we're looking for. Uh, the method returns a locked node that is closer to the value that we're looking for than the one we started out with. So this actually does the teleportation. Adding and removing elements is done somewhere else. So all we're doing is we're just moving the lock uh, forward. Uh, we retry for some number of times. If it fails too often, then uh, we're doing something wrong and we quit. <coughs> so uh, if we're inside the transaction, then we traverse up to the limit we've chosen. So every thread has a thread local teleport limit, which uh, determines how far to, how far to go. Uh, we move the lock, we clear the bits on the old lock, we set the bit on the new lock. After all, a lock is just a, you know, a byte or a word in, in memory. And then we call xend, which commit, tries to commit the transaction. If xend succeeds, <coughs> if xend succeeds, then, uh, we, uh, then we increase our teleport limit by one, and we return uh, the last uh, node and we lock and return the last node. So it's, uh, this is a very adaptive uh, strategy. And in the worst case, if you don't uh, teleport at all, then you're no worse off uh, that, than you were before. But this is an example of how you can use hardware transactions to accelerate uh, things that you were doing before. <coughs> 
So hardware transactions uh, work well as a kind of a fast path. Uh, but you still need uh, to be able to deal with the fact that hardware transactions can fail. They can fail for any reason. And so you need to have a backup plan. So if, um, if you abort, then you cut the teleport limit in half. And uh, you know, there, actually, we don't always cut it in half. If it gets too small, then there's no point in having a teleport limit of zero. But uh, this is the code that fits on the, uh, on the slide. OK, so uh, roadmap. Uh, actually, that's the wrong roadmap. OK, so the, um, <coughs> the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about programming language support. Now, uh, I have to apologize a little bit because the examples that I'm showing here are from a, a slide from about two years ago. And a lot of things have changed uh, since then. So there are things that are missing here are uh, uh, Scala and, um, let's see, and, and there are a few others. I think at one point I counted there are 17 at least programming languages that either provide what's called software transactional memory as part of the language or as a library. And some languages have more than one the competing library to, um, uh, to do this. Now, this is different from hardware transactional memory because you can run these on any machine, any machine at all. It doesn't have to have hardware or support. In fact, most of these aren't yet able to take advantage of uh, hardware uh, transactions. So my vision for the future <coughs> is that hardware transactions can be used to accelerate the transactional memory libraries or mechanisms that are built into these languages. And the best of both worlds are you have a nice clean interface of the kind that the programming languages give you together with uh, the fast performance of the, of the hardware. So the languages are elegant and slow and the hardware is ugly and fast. And uh, what we need is to get something that is elegant and fast and hopefully not ugly and slow. So uh, one question that comes up in a programming language is uh, what What's the granularity of atomicity here? So in languages like Java and C Sharp and so on, it makes sense to say that the unit managed by the transaction memory is an object. This is good also because you can put in uh, ways to override the built-in uh, synchronization and allow special case synchronization where I know that, op that hash table operations on different keys commute. So even if they touch the same performance counter, I can uh, tell the language to uh, ignore that and allow them to uh, go, go on in parallel. Object-based transactions <coughs> are fairly dangerous in languages like C or C++ because the language fundamentally has no notion of an object. Uh, nothing prevents you from adding 27 to a pointer and then storing into that uh, location. Now, with modern C++, that's not entirely fair because if you do that, you deserve what happens to you. Uh, but it's certainly true of C. You know, so C++ is kind of migrating into an object-oriented world, but it hasn't uh, completely forgotten its uh, primitive uh, uh, jungle uh, roots. Uh, one of the things about that happens in um, languages like C and C++ is it becomes difficult to control interactions between transactional and non-transactional code. So if one thread is non-transactional, stores into a location that it was read by a transaction, then uh, it can be expensive to uh, detect that. But in object-oriented languages, it's uh, much easier because you're going through uh, methods. Um, now, in the hardware transactions, we don't update memory immediately. We wait until we commit. In soft, the software transactions, <coughs> underlying different programming languages, you could do it either way. You could either update the object directly and keep an undo log. Uh, this has the advantage that committing a transaction is fast because you already made the change and you throw away the undo log. Or you can buffer the changes and apply them when you uh, commit. And there are very complicated trade-offs uh, between these uh, two uh, uh, things. Whichever uh, direction you favor, I can come up with an argument why the other is better. 
And I think right now most implementations are um, use deferred updates because it's easier to uh, guarantee different forms of uh, consistency that way. Uh, conflict detection. So you can detect conflicts when they happen or you can de detect conflicts when you commit. And here too there are complicated trade-offs. So in eager detection, I can say, oh, you want to write this object, but somebody else has already written this object. And I can delay one uh, thread. I can abort one thread. I can decide which thread to abort. I can put in any kind of sophisticated policy I want. Uh, for example, um, I've seen policies where you say it's okay to wait for, a, for one transaction to wait for another, but only if the queues are of length one that anybody who tries to create a, a, a waiting a chain of a length a greater than one, uh, you abort them because we're afraid of deadlocks and, and uh, things like that. So uh, eager gives you more freedom to manage things. Uh, lazy has some advantages uh, because it may be that the conflict will go away and you, you were too eager to abort uh, the uh, transaction. Uh, one popular approach is to mix things. So maybe write-write conflicts are detected eagerly and read-write conflicts are detected lazily. <coughs> so again, eager detection might abort tran transactions that would have committed if you let them uh, uh, go on for a while. But the problem with lazy computation is that uh, you might have a transaction that is going to abort but it runs for a long time before it tries to commit and wastes a lot of uh, resources. And, and again, this is something where um, there are many differences of opinion about which is the best approach. Um, there are many different policies for scheduling and uh, managing of these various uh, conflicts. Uh, in some sense, what you're doing is you're writing a policy that says who, goes, who gets to take steps and who gets blocked, who is aborted and who, who gets to uh, continue. And uh, there's you know, it's hard to prove things about this. It's not clear whether any such proofs, uh, you know, what the relevance is to actual uh, performance. There are a number of empirical studies which basically show that uh, no single policy is uh, universally the best. That uh, for some workloads, one policy is better, for other workloads, another policy is better. And so then the next thing to say is, well, maybe we should be adaptive and try to figure out uh, what kind of workload we're doing. Uh, people have proposed machine learning algorithms for figuring out uh, what policies. This is something where there's still a lot of uh, work uh, that needs to be done. Uh, people have experimented with exponential backoff. tends to be fairly uh, wasteful. Uh, giving the oldest transaction or, or the transaction that has done the most work priority has the advantage that every transaction eventually commits, so you never starve. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so basically, you know, this is something where we need um, more insight. Now, I.O. is a difficult uh, a problem. So if you're running inside a speculative uh, transaction, then uh, doing I.O. is bad because you might do something like open the cash drawer on a bank machine, and the customer takes the money, and then you abort the transaction. You know, that's not a very good way to, to, to run a, a bank. So there are problems with uh, what happens when your code tries to make a change to the outside world. Now, there are many different strategies. You could postpone changes to the end. That works in some problems and not others. Uh, one solution that people have looked at is as soon as you try to do I.O., your transaction becomes irrevocable, which means it is no longer speculative and it cannot be rolled back. And the problem with this is that uh, you can have only one irrevocable transaction in your system at a time because if you had two, they could deadlock. And then what? So irrevocable transactions kind of solve the problem, but uh, often at a, a cost that's not uh, really acceptable. So this is, <coughs> this is an area where um, there are many options and none of them seem to be perfect. So in practice, I think people use a lot of special cases to, to deal with um, IO and anything that uh, affects the outside world. 
Uh, exceptions have raised interesting uh, semantic problems. So here I have a, an atomic block where I allocate uh, some memory. Outside the atomic block, I have something that catches an exception. So I have, also have a variable i, which is 0 outside. I increment it inside the atomic block. And then the exception handler prints it. And guess what happens? When I call node, it throws an out-of-memory exception. Now, nobody expects an out-of-memory exception. And uh, you know, unless you're a really, really careful programmer, there's no handler for it. So the exception just blasts out of the transaction and it's caught by this uh, generic exception handler. <coughs> and the question is, what value should it print? So if the transaction aborts, it should print 0. If the transaction commits, it should print uh, 1. So we have a, uh, an unhandled exception inside a transaction that is, we have a transaction, an exception that is unhandled inside the transaction but handled outside the transaction. And the question is, uh, what happens? Uh, does that transaction commit or abort? Now, you can argue it either way. So you can say, well, of course you should abort the transaction. An unhandled exception inside a transaction is a sign that something is terribly wrong. The purpose of transactions is to pr preserve consistency, to preserve invariance. And if you, have a, if you throw an exception in the middle of code, you have almost certainly broken something. And the best you, thing you can do is you can roll back to a previous consistent state and then handle the exception. So that's one side. The other side says, <coughs> well, no, we want transactions to look like synchronized blocks because that's what programmers expect. And if you, th if you throw an exception inside a synchronized block, we don't roll back the partial effects of that block. Uh, it's as if the uh, synchronized block uh, committed when the control passed out. And for this reason, in order to look as much as possible like a synchronized block, we should commit the transaction. Now, uh, what uh, happens in the C++ software transactional uh, memory standard, you have to declare for every exception whether it, it aborts or, or commits a transaction if it's not handled inside a transaction, which is clumsy, but it satisfies both sides of the, of the argument. <coughs> Nested transactions are, are a question. So, uh, what, suppose my sign routine has an internal transaction that I don't know about, and I want to call it from inside transactional code. I should be able to do that for modularity reasons. I should not need to know whether a method that I call itself uses a, a transaction. So I should be able to, <coughs> to nest them. Now, but that doesn't answer the question of what does it mean to nest transactions. So hardware transactions, you provide what is called flat nesting. So the uh, IED6 architecture has a hidden counter, and if you start a transaction when you're already inside a transaction, it increments the counter. And then when you leave a tra transaction, it decrements the counter, and when that counter reaches zero, it commits the transaction or aborts it. But this is called flat nesting because if a child transaction aborts, everything aborts. So the, everything is flattened into one single transaction. Uh, languages like uh, the Haskell STM system uh, have what's called first-class uh, nesting because a nested transaction can abort without aborting its parent. And this is a, a much nicer abstraction and much more powerful abstraction for th doing things like conditional weighting and so on. But it's more expensive because instead of having a single backup version, you need a stack of backup versions. And so this, is, this would be too complicated to do in hardware so it seems like a good compromise to say, well, hardware is flat nesting, but software should probably be um, um, first-class nesting, except if you think it's too inefficient. Now, a question that comes up, and there's been lots and lots of work on this, <coughs> is you can say, well, transactions and serializability are... Um, very strong properties. And maybe they're just a little bit too idealistic. For example, how can I debug a trans transactional code? If something goes wrong, 
the whole purpose of the transaction is that everything is erased. And I have no way of telling what happened. I get a very, very little information out of, a, out of an aborted transaction. It's like um, back when I first started uh, using a, a computer, I had a machine that had three LEDs. And when it would crash, it would set, set a condition code. And so we had no idea what happened except that it was error 47. And uh, this was uh, very difficult to uh, work with. So you can say, well, <clears throat> maybe what we need are escape mechanisms. I need some way to say, well, I want transactions, but without strict serializability, I want to have some kind of relaxed uh, serializability. I want to have some way of uh, sneaking information out. And the answer here is that, yes, there are many ways in which relaxed consistency models are very useful. But the difficulty here is you want to provide something that is strong enough to be useful, but not too dangerous. Now, in the database world, for many years, people were publishing papers saying that database serializability is too strong. <clears throat> Here is a more complicated but weaker property that uh, gives you more concurrency and better recovery. And every single one of those properties has pretty much been forgotten, with the exception of um, snapshot consistency. But uh, there have been dozens of these things. And it, turned, it turns out that it's like uh, trying to cut your fingernails with a, with a hatchet. It's, um, these, these escape mechanisms are so powerful and so hard to understand that it's easy to uh, break things. So I do think that we need to think carefully about ways of relaxing strict serializability to help things, to help with questions like debugging, to help with uh, certain performance issues. But you need to be extremely careful because almost anything you think of uh, could be incredibly dangerous if used by a, uh, a programmer who is not as smart as you are. OK, so <clears throat> to wrap up, every uh, new idea in computer science goes through the same kind of cycle. So think of garbage collection. Think of virtual memory. So somebody has an idea and they invent it. And then this gets published, and people say, oh, this is the most amazing idea ever. This is wonderful. This will create world peace. This will prevent global uh, warming. You know, this will do all these wonderful things. And then they think about it for a while, and they say, wait a second. All you did was you, you, know, you promised me all this wonderful stuff, but in fact, all you did was you replaced one set of problems with another. And you just did that so you could publish papers in conferences and uh, give uh, talks at places like this. You know, you're uh, an exploitative uh, fraud. And this is the trough of disillusionment. When people believe in ideals and then they discover that the ideals are not as wonderful as they thought, then they get, go in the other direction. And then what happens is after the reaction, then people start to address the various problems. So many of the problems that I've described here are research issues. Some of them people have made a lot of progress on, others maybe not so much progress. But uh, what happens is that things gradually get better. So when garbage collection came out, everyone said, <coughs> oh, this will so <coughs> solve memory problems forever. And then they said, wait a second, it takes two hours to uh, garbage collect my, uh, my program. You know, garbage collection is a fraud. It's only... Uh, you know, it, it's a, a crazy, uh, you know, religious idea that uh, will never uh, work. And then slowly garbage collectors got better and better. And now languages like Java have garbage collectors, which would have been a radical idea in uh, 1980. But today, uh, nobody pays any attention to it. Uh, virtual memory is the same thing. When the first virtual memory uh, algorithms that came out uh, were disasters. And slowly people uh, said, oh, working sets are important. No, this matters, that matters, L LRU, all of these ideas. And none of them was dramatic. None of them dramatically changed everything. It was a very slow process. And so uh, transactional memory, I think, goes through the same period where when it first came out, there was a lot of hype. Uh, there was a kind of reaction. Uh, if you look at Twitter or 4chan and things like that, uh, there are people who say some very nasty things about transactional memory along with everything else. Uh, but then gradually, people have been improving things to the point where it's not perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. 
but it's starting to uh, become more normal. And so I think what will happen is that eventually uh, transactional memory will be a, su a success when nobody talks about it anymore, but everyone uses it, just like a garbage collection. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the uh, last thing is to point out that there's two reasons to believe that transactional models of programming will never go away. Uh, one is that it's now part of the I-86 architecture. And once something goes into the I-86 architecture, it never, ever goes out. There are machine instructions in I-86, which I've been told by in Intel engineers, were put there to support hardware garbage collection algorithms that nobody uses. And the uh, engineers are very angry because for 50 years they've supported these instructions, which nobody uses, but they can't take them away because some bank somewhere probably uses them for some strange reason. And uh, if they take them out, uh, then there'll be lawsuits and disasters and so on. So uh, once transactions are present in the architecture, they're not going to go away. Transactions are also uh, uh, probably going to be part of a future C++ standard. Uh, GNU, uh, the GNU compiler already supports uh, software transactions. And once something is part of C and C++, it will also uh, never go away. It may be buried under more libraries, but it's, uh, it's like one of those viruses that never completely vanishes. You know, it, it's, it's going to uh, be there uh, forever. So that's everything that I have to say. Yeah, that it works. Okay, questions, guys. Just hands up and. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, first practical uh, question is: Am I right that this techn Intel technology, with, which was introduced in Haswell, it's supported in all current uh, Intel processors? I didn't quite hear. Uh. Uh, is that uh, this uh, technology which you uh, described uh, uh, was introduced in Intel Haswell processors are supported in all current Intel <coughs> processors? Uh, so it was introduced in Haskell. Then somebody discovered a bug in the hardware where you could commit a, a transaction in, with an inconsistent uh, state. So it was then disabled in Haswell for the rest of the production you, in, in firmware. You can turn it back on again if you needed. Then in the following generation, they fixed it. So every I-86 uh, chip that is now made by Intel uh, uh, supports it. So, so there was this uh, period where they had to turn it off because they, they made a, an error. But uh, that has uh, been fixed. And as far as anyone knows, the current uh, in Intel I-86-based architectures uh, correctly implement uh, transactional memory. Now, if you buy a small laptop, they will disable it to save power. So the assumption is that if you have a small laptop, you don't really care much about concurrency, but you care a lot about your battery. And so then it makes sense to, to again, you turn it off in firmware. You can turn it back on again by making system calls, but the default is that it's turned off. If you buy one of these laptops for playing uh, games, you know, with the big uh, GPUs and stuff like that, then, uh, then it's turned on by default. Thank you. Next questions? Come on. Uh-huh. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, the question is, are there any profiling or debugging tools? How are you supposed to measure the performance of this approach with atomic sections? Because you know when you use logs, you just add some logging or something. But here, if you insert some code, then you influence these transactions, you introduce more memory operations and... No, that, no that's a very good <coughs> uh, question. So performance you can um, test in the usual way by, by running a benchmarks. Debugging is kind of a nightmare. Uh, the, I understand there are internal tools in, at Intel, which they won't talk to me about, that they, u that they use for debugging uh, hardware. But uh, right now, the situation is uh, very uh, primitive. There is a story um, 
there's a, there's a company called Azul, which uh, specializes in write, building big machines that run only Java programs. And they built their own hardware transactional memory for, for synchronized blocks. Then they discovered that the standard Java uh, hash table, uh, some version that is now deprecated, every operation incremented an internal counter. It was a counter of mutators. But nobody ever read that counter. It was a write-only counter, but that is enough to make sure that the hardware transactional memory was useless for that hash table because every operation, uh, every pair of operations conflicted on this useless uh, counter. And so uh, detecting that kind of thing is difficult because all you would see is that your transactions abort when they shouldn't. And then you have to look at, there's a list of things, you know, are they, is there false sharing on the caches? Is there a counter you don't know about, a performance counter? So this is one area where a lot of progress uh, needs to be made. Thank you. Uh, it never became part of Java, of course, but uh, maybe could you recommend how I can play with transactional memory in Java? Uh, maybe it uh, can be a kind of library or something else, exclude closure or something. So, so I, I work, <coughs> I uh, consult for Sun every, every now and then, and I worked with a, um, they had a special version of the JVM that, that, that used an early hardware transactional memory from the Raka processor. But it was, uh, it was almost like a comical story because the hardware transactions only worked for compiled code, not for uh, interpreting code. And so you had to trick the um, runtime system into compiling code. So you execute the same piece of code a million times, and it says, oh, this is a hotspot. This was actually the hotspot um, uh, JVM, and it will compile it. And so you could tell when your transaction started to commit, instead of aborting, okay, now, now we're compiled. And then you can run some benchmarks. But then, for no reason at all, it goes back to inter interpreting things. And I got very frustrated, and I basically stopped, stopped working on that uh, uh, for this reason. But I think, the, um, I think this is another case where, uh, just like in C++, there's a lot of promise. And somebody should do this. Uh, but I think this will probably happen in some, in some point in the future. But I don't know when or who's going to do it. But it, this would be a very useful thing to have. And I don't think it's impossible. And probably the last question. Ah, two last questions. OK. Thanks a lot for the awesome talk. I have actually a couple of questions. And the first one is uh, you described an awesome approach. And it uh, has uh, obvious benefit comparing to logs. Uh, composing of atomic sections is trivial, but what kind of downsides of the approach as a uh, as an abstraction? What's so I think I think the ma the major downside of the approach as an abstraction is that we don't know how to make the abstraction uh, watertight. So we have um, you know eighty percent abstraction, and then there are these big holes in the abstraction that need to be fixed. Uh, how to fix it. Gradually, there are fewer holes now than there were last year. So slowly, people are realizing uh, what it, you need to do to turn this into something uh, usable. Uh, the, uh, I think the most elegant uh, um, abstraction for transactional memory is probably the Haskell uh, STM um, uh, uh, package. Uh, whether you like the performance or not is a, is a different issue. But gradually, kind of like garbage collection, if you come up with a nice abstraction, then people will figure out how to make it run fast. And I think that works better than going the other way. You know, coming up with something that runs fast but is ugly is um, not a good long-term strategy. Really, it's like making a tunnel. You need to have the two uh, meet at some point. And you know, we're certainly far from doing that now, but uh, you know, maybe people here will figure out how to do that. Thanks a lot. And uh, the another question is about hardware transactional memory. And uh, uh, it heavily relies on cache coherency, but considering uh, the huge increase uh, uh, of uh, cores, uh, cache coherency protocols are more ex and more expensive. So uh, how do you see uh, 
hardware transactional memory beyond the cache coherency? So eventually, uh, eventually, I think when everyone moves to multi-socket machines, cache coherence is going to wither away. It's just too hard to keep cache coherence across uh, multiple uh, sockets. Already, it's uh, difficult for you know Oracle and so on to, to do this. Now, the uh, you can build transactional memories based on uh, logs and other kinds of database-like uh, structures, and people publish papers about this. Uh, what happens is that building on, on top of cache coherence was so easy that that's how everyone did it. When cache coherence goes away, all of these issues will have to be rethought. And I don't think it's uh, all that difficult to uh, build a, a transactional memory system that is somewhat like the uses uh, uh, techniques of the way the databases do, undo logs and, and things like that. A uh, very interesting direction is if you look at non-volatile memory, uh, there are all kinds of issues with you have volatile caches but non-volatile main memory and you need to keep them consistent. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity to build a transactional memory that uses the non-volatile uh, memory downstairs uh, while tolerating the failures in, in, the, um, in the caches. So, so that's another very promising area of research that is only now starting to, uh, to, to happen. But is there any place for hardware transactional memory or it will uh, wither away oh. <coughs> in uh, Oh, uh, no, software? I think th th this will be done in, in hardware. So the hardware will manage the, uh, the uh, logs and uh, the uh, uh, s conflict detection and so on. You know, the, the hardware is, these are very simple tasks that need to be done very often. And that's, that's what hardware is good for. Hardware is not good for complicated things or for things that uh, don't happen uh, very often. So I think something like the hybrid transactional memory where the hardware will give you certain primitives that are extremely fast and the software puts them together in, a, uh, in an effective way will be the future. But right now, nobody knows exactly what these, this interface is. Thanks a lot. And a uh, quick comment about the previous question about support uh, so, soft, uh, hardware transactional memory in Java. So Intel contributed uh, uh, in some improvements into Hotspot GVM, which utilizes uh, these, those new instructions for ordinary Java logs. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for uh, Java Util concurrent tools, but for uh, internal logs for ordinary uh, Java objects, it works pretty well if uh, your hardware is stable enough. So. Give it a try. Thanks a lot again for an awesome talk. And the last question? So, okay. <coughs> so it seems that your questions already was answered. So, okay. Uh, thank you for coming and let's clap very, very loudly. <laughs> Louder. Louder. Thank you very much.